I am Heidi Benjaminson, your host of Confidence Coaching, a podcast for mothers of teenagers who want to feel like they aren't failing. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 105, Sexuality and Confidence. I'm excited to bring to you an interview I did recently with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Actually, I just said I'm excited. I think I am thrilled and over the moon, actually. Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife is a highly respected and regarded therapist, counselor, and coach, helping couples, primarily LDS, but all couples, achieve satisfaction and pleasure sexually and emotionally in their marriages. I knew Jennifer in Boston well over two decades ago and have followed her teachings, her podcasts, her classes for a long time, and I admire her grace, her class, and her deep insight. I have links to her classes and her podcast in my show notes. I hope you enjoy her insights on confidence, perfectionism, and how we integrate our sexuality and integrity as an example to our children. Plus, we leave you at the end with a few of our own insecurities. So let's get to it. Here is my interview with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. All right, Jennifer, I am so grateful you are here on my podcast. Jennifer and I knew each other in Boston over 25 years ago. We went to church together. We had a mutual best friend. And I know you, I deeply admire you and the work you have done, but some of my listeners might not know you. So would you please introduce yourself and uh, for the people unfamiliar with you and tell us about your work? Sure. So I'm Jennifer Finlayson Fife, and um, I have a PhD in counseling psychology. That's why I was in Boston with Heidi, um, because I was there. in the ward. And I my work, my dissertation, I wrote on um, LDS women and sexual agency. So I was looking at how LDS women had related to their sexuality and looking at the differences between the women who really thrived in marriage and those who did not. So that kind of launched me into the focus of my work, which is helping primarily LDS couples and individuals to have more intimate relationships um, and to be a deeper peace with themselves, which is really part and parcel to being capable of intimacy, that is to be knowable, to let yourself be known emotionally, sexually, and otherwise. So that's my work and I I do coaching, but I also mm-hmm. teach a lot of online courses and do live events as well to help people get a, a, another way of thinking about how to be in relationship to, uh, how to be in relationship to themselves mm-hmm. and important people in their lives in a more mm-hmm. peaceful way. Okay, that is wonderful. That is great. And we will link up your, um, you know, websites and courses and things like that. They really are fantastic. So most of my listeners and clients are women, mothers of teenagers who are feeling overwhelming insecurity in how to handle parenting teens in 2021, which is for sure different than when we were teenagers and is different than it was even five years ago. That's very true. Yeah. And we, we want to have the confidence we're doing the right thing. Maybe tell us the age of your kids. I think they're roughly the same as mine. You've got some teens in there too, Right. but then also like, how would you define confidence? Well, first of all, I will just say that I used to be much more confident as a parent (laughs) until I had teenagers. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, teenagers will do it to you. They're like, you know, you think you're a good parent. You're not. Let me just show you something. (laughs) Exactly. And I would also agree that that kids currently, there are so many cultural shifts. There are are ways of thinking that I think are really kind of overwhelming a lot of Mm -hmm. thoughtful, earnest parents. And, you know, I find myself saying things like kids these days, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all the things I used to laugh at older people saying, Same, and, you yeah. know, it's just, it's, but it's true. We're right this time. So exactly. anyway, but, <laughs> but uh, confidence, how would I define it? I mean, confidence can be overrated. I guess I would say that because you don't want to have okay. false confidence and a lot mm-hmm. of us have false confidence and it's not a virtue, but I think 
the kind of greatest thing to have confidence in is confidence in our ability, um, our ability and willingness to learn and to tolerate fallibility without it taking us off course. So if you're going to have confidence in anything, have confidence in your ability to persevere in the face of opposition, to master what you need. So that's more process confidence, which I think is more important than confidence around a specific skill. Because as soon as you encounter where you're lacking in that skill, which we always will, you should have your confidence undermined because that would be truth. Right, right, <laughs> right. And right. Instead of it kind of outcome or result confidence. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kind exactly. of process Just confidence. Believing in your ability to solve things, believing in your ability to address things, even if mm -hmm. imperfectly, that you have enough confidence in your tolerance of that process that you will go towards it. That's what mm -hmm. I think is the most important. Those of us who are more avoidant or more anxious about our ability to handle adversity will tend to step away from where we're not capable Mm -hmm. won't take on challenges and then even if we're not having our competency actively challenged through what mm -hmm. we're doing because we're avoiding our mm -hmm. confidence in our capacity will go down because it's not being tested and developed right and we're not okay right with the failing and the falling which that leads really well to kind of the next thing I wanted to ask you about, like a lot of the work I do with clients and confidence is really us dismantling their perfectionism that they have, mm -hmm. um, which includes like helping them like really build up their confidence to allow them to make mistakes, mm -hmm. to also give themselves grace for like past mistakes or inadequacies, Absolutely. and then to stop seeking this like imaginable flawless life. And one of the right. ways it shows up is like, I want to make the right decision for my child. I want to have the right rules or structure. I want to get them into the right school, whatever that is. How would you see building confidence as an important tool to dismantle perfectionism. Yeah, or I might put it the other way. You have to dismantle perfectionism in okay. order to develop confidence because- Absolutely. Yeah, because perfectionism is this fantasy that you can kind of get yourself out of the human condition and that there is some problem-free life that exists you know, mm -hmm. or that you can do it in a flawless way. Mm -hmm. And that belief alone will interfere with your development of honest confidence because you're, you're either going to be underexposed because you don't want the exposure of your limitations so you won't try and do things, or you'll kind of insist on believing you got something right, you know, mm -hmm. or kind of mm -hmm. need it to, or feel so fractured by the exposure of it being a limited choice that you'll struggle to refine it and to keep developing it. I think the mm -hmm. people that have the most confidence in themselves are people that are more okay with the fallibility of their of life. They don't believe in the idea there's one right way. Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. think God has the answer and they just have to get it. Mm -hmm. They see it more as being earnestly engaged in a good cause, mm -hmm. that intention matters, that trying to sort out what's true and right and best, even though that's kind of, that there may be multiple best ways, believe in the process of discerning. Mm -hmm. and, you know, my, my own children have each had their own challenges as teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I think what matters to kids is to see that they matter enough for you to fallibly step towards them and try to help them. And, yes. you know, believe me, I've, I've yeah. done it all imperfectly. Right, 100%. right. Yes. <laughs> but, I'm with you. you. Know, <laughs> but, you know, I'm like one son who was especially struggling, you know, said to me kind of after he kind of came out of the thick of it, said, you know, I'm really grateful to you and dad because I could track how much you cared about me. Uh. So even though we really didn't have the answers and I didn't know where we expecting too much? Were we expecting too little? Mm -hmm. Were we making too mm -hmm. many rules, not enough rules yep. and getting it wrong? A lot of, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to say there was some right answer because another thing he said was, I just needed to go through that. There wasn't really something you could have done. You could have it even a, done. Exactly. Yes, I just had to work something out with myself. And mm -hmm. I know he's right about that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I don't mean to say we got everything right. We didn't, but, but I think that 
there was no way for me to know mm -hmm. other than to get in there and to try and to care and to care enough about him that I was willing to look honestly at myself, you know, let my spouse tell me what he could see about me and my relationship with my son and mm -hmm. vice versa, like to just try and the trying out. right like yeah. just the trying again is that sense of confidence that like oh we're gonna try again like yes. that alone like we're not gonna give up that's right and they can see it yeah that's right and i think that telegraphs to your child you're worth my effort and you yeah. know, my, this child was struggling with some depression and anxiety and i think for him to map that was what allowed him to say i i need help I do mm -hmm. need more help than I can provide for myself. And I think that just is a an important message. One of the things I know in myself is I wanted to believe in some ways that I had all the answers. Yes, and or just... the answers out there. If I can yes. just like Google it Precisely. the right way or talk <laughs> to the right person or exactly. yeah, we have this false sense of yeah. right somewhere. Yeah. Yes. And you know, that would be wonderful if you could Google the right thing as a parent, do the right thing and everything's cleaned up and solved. And unfortunately, I think one of the hardest things about parenting is maybe what we also understand about God is the limits of control. Yes. That to tolerate that this human being has their own choices to make, mm -hmm. their own de development to address, and I can care about it and I can care about them, but I can't make them rise to the occasion. I can't make them solve it. So I think that's a really hard thing. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. Like for uh, that realization, I have way less control than I even would like to have, like in a lot of ways, because we want to control the outcome. That's right. So yes. in, in terms of perfectionism, like I teach that perfectionism disconnects us from three people. Like the first, if, if people have Christian beliefs, like a savior who atoned for our sins is that first disconnected connection. The, the next one is other people because we connect with others through vulnerability. So if we're mm -hmm. trying to be perfect, there's no yes. connection. And then the last connection with ourselves because we can't develop any self-love and self-grace. And yes. in that, you know, we lose our sense of identity. We lose the sense of I'm a child of God or a human yes. who's inherently flawed. So what are what are your thoughts on that? And how do you think as women, we can regain like this sense of identity of humanity and, you know, confidence, however, that yeah. would go into that? Well, I think a couple of things about that. So I first I agree with you, it's mm -hmm. perfectionism interferes with intimacy with ourselves, with others, and with God, you mm -hmm. because you think I'm defective, I'm insufficient, so I don't want to be known, even to myself, mm -hmm. because I can't handle what I see. I can't mm -hmm. handle recognizing my flawed state. And that is an exposure of our underdevelopment of compassion in, in general, compassion <laughs> towards ourselves, compassion towards others, con compassion towards our human state, mm -hmm. and believing in a God that has that same compassion. That's mm. developmentally very important. Mm -hmm. The fact that we may not have it yet, or that you recognize in yourself a harshness, very likely you've come by it honestly, either because right. you grew up in a harsh environment, you internalize that way of relating to yourself. But even if you grew up in a relatively loving environment, compassion is something you develop. It's a capacity you can develop over time. Over time. Mm -hmm. To learn to offer yourself grace. Now, mm -hmm. I don't mean indulgence, like, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter what I do. Right, right, because that's not love, right? That's not love, <laughs> exactly. And that's not even good to yourself because, you know, I work with clients who are so afraid of failure that they step back from everything. And it's a kind of indulgence, but they still feel terrible about themselves. So allowing yourself to be human, allowing others to be human, and loving in the face of that inherent vulnerability like you know i think you were just saying heidi like when just tolerating what you can't control mm -hmm. and still loving in the face of that uncertainty in the face of the anxiety that's a part of that is i think spiritually a step forward mm -hmm. and i think christian theology is very much this theology mm -hmm. that christ talked very much about a relational quality of our faith to mm -hmm. know and be known 
that it's in relationship to the divine, in relationship to one another, that we come to understand truth and to become freer. And by free, it's again, not indulgent freedom, a freedom that has a, a moral tether to it, right. but it's a kind of liberty to be truthful mm -hmm. to ourselves and to others, to not live in constant anxiety and judgment and fear. Yeah, like the reality of seeing, it's the freedom to see reality. That's like right. That we are human. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I matter and I'm flawed. Right. You and I'm matter, flawed and, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's all okay. Right. And, you know, to be able to offer that to your child, oh, it's a massive gift. Yeah. To yeah. Know that, Huge. that you see that the parent sees that in the child who hasn't yet developed that, that the parent relates to themselves in that way and mm -hmm. to other human beings that way. Mm -hmm. That's a incredibly helpful to believe in that compassionate world. Yes. And a God yes. that is that compassionate. Because a lot of us have a notion of God that's more like our parents mm -hmm. that may be much more limited than God than, than who God actually is. You know, I think that goes into right, do we parent from fear or kind of from love or hope? You know, mm -hmm. many mothers struggle to see their kids make mistakes. And sure. and so I, you know, work with a lot of clients and some of those mistakes are big, some are small, however people would kind of define that. So what would you say, and this goes into kind of that perfectionism of when we maybe find out our child is, is uh, making some of these mistakes, we find out they're starting to vape, or maybe we catch them stealing or doing drugs or lying or kind of whatever that is. Like, how would you say we really need to see that situation? I'm not talking about like the health of that necessarily, but in yeah. terms of like confidence and maturity. And I will say the number one thought that people come to me, the biggest obstacle, and I see it in myself, in my mm -hmm. own head, mm -hmm, is that sure. we think they shouldn't be doing this, like sure. shouldn't, right? Yes, right. So mm -hmm. what would you say? as some counsel to get sure. over that. <laughs> well, well, first of all, when you freak out, just be kind to yourself. <laughs> because, you know, it's hard. It's really hard when you had it is you hard. Know, kids yes. underfoot and they were, you know, lots of work when your kids are tiny. But at least you have high control. Right. right. You know? Yes. Yes. So it's intensive in a different way. But there you have a strong sense that, you know, they're referencing you for every decision. And, and so at least you don't question where they are at nine o'clock or whatever, 11 o'clock right, at night. Right, right. Or what they're doing uh, online what or whatever. What they're doing online, yes. exactly. When you're trying to birth adults, which is what adolescence is, is <laughs> they're pushing away from you and they're starting to reference their peers and they're starting to figure out who they are and they're exercising their agency in ways that may very well work against them, yet mm -hmm. they're trying to sort out who they are. It's a very insecure time. It's where mm -hmm. they're referencing peers for better or for worse. And they are going to be making mistakes. And yes. you don't okay. need to like it. You don't need to enjoy any of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> However, I which think... is really good news for all of us, right? <laughs> like nobody else is enjoying this. <laughs> no, and it's and, and having compassion for yourself as a parent and your child during this difficult, awkward, challenging time. It's it's sort of like crowning the same kind of how much you enjoyed it when you're giving birth. <laughs> right, right. Good <laughs> analogy. Crowning yes. Crowning and birthing an adult. Okay, it is not fun. Right. Um, and there are no epidurals, right? No epidurals, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. So, so, th so I think compassion just for yourself. And, and then I think better than they shouldn't be doing it to say, who is my child that they are doing it? Mm. So what is going on? And I don't mm -hmm. want to come in there with judgment and harshness and all that, because that's going to interfere with my ability to be useful to know where to set limits or how to respond. But what is it expressing about my child that they're making this choice? Okay, I love that. Mm -hmm. Is it that they're lacking friends that they want to fit in? Is it that mm -hmm. they're in a lot of pain and anxiety? That's why they're vaping or whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. You know, Is it that they're trying to self-medicate? Is it a chronic thing? Is it one-time experimental thing? Is mm -hmm. it they're just sort of trying to sort out who they are, but they're not really vulnerable or are they vulnerable to something here because of a larger issue that that needs addressing so if you can get curious rather than fearful and judgmental and again mm -hmm. it's to say this than to do it but, right right but the more you can settle down enough to say 
in most respects, nothing is going wrong here. My mm -hmm. child is being an adolescent. And one bit of good news is sometimes super compliant adolescents have crises down the road. Uh -huh. If they are just like, I'll be the ideal son or daughter, do everything mom and dad wants. A lot of times their crisis happens at age 40 when they're married and have three kids. And they're right. And they then don't have another loving adult yes. watching over exactly. to maybe help. So the more your child can sort out honestly for themselves, their own life and their own path and to choose it from them, from a pleasing frame or a mm -hmm. defiant frame, mm -hmm. but from a position of this is what I really want your child is going to walk a path that they can really live with 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. So there's possibility in this moment of mm -hmm. them sorting out their themselves and who they are, especially right. if you're coming at it from a place of caring about them. Mm -hmm. understanding, and not being fearful, like being able to yeah. manage your fears and put them in the back. Yes, yeah, exactly. And you, you have every right to be afraid because you don't know right. what they're going to do. Maybe they'll exactly. get way into this and they'll have a substance abuse problem. Exactly. Yeah, they the could. fear is normal because we the love them. We love them and it's up to them much more than us. That's the other problematic <laughs> right. part of this whole plan. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow um, we bought into. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think if you can sort of tolerate that, and I, I think that's not easy. Like, I love you and I recognize mm -hmm. you have choices that you can at least figure out, am I giving my child too much latitude and freedom? Do they need less? Is this mm -hmm. more than they can handle? Do I need to talk to them about what is happening and really listen to them? Mm -hmm. you know, as one of my children said to me, mom, you're a terrible listener. Now, you know, I'm a professional listener. I <laughs> Did you tell her to ask your clients? No, they say I'm good. <laughs> no. Exactly. I can listen to them forever because it doesn't reflect on me, you know. But right, right. You, you don't like have to manage your brain on... through that. Exactly. exactly. And you feel like it reflects on you that this person matters more than life to you. And so then your ability to listen will go down because it's hard to handle hearing what they're saying or what they're struggling with or what, you know, so I'd be like, mm -hmm. well, just do it like this. Just, mm -hmm. just do it like that. Like, mm -hmm. Trying to give them the answers rather than just walking through the difficulty with him enough to see more clearly mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. help him see more clearly if I would have settled down a little more. Right. But then I, they're not. You know, I, yeah. Right. Right. So I that wanted is good... so much to provide an answer that I was actually not knowing him enough. Right, right. And not helping them like kind of have a little bit less anxiety about even what they're going through. So that is, I mean, that leads into like, how do we separate our choices from our children's choices? Like our confidence that I am, regardless of what my child does, which again, all of this we know is easier said than done. Like what my child does is more reflection on where they are and their mm -hmm. developmental and mm -hmm. also just the choices they want to make. Mm -hmm. And it's not a reflection on my value as a parent, as a right. woman, you know, because right. we reek of insecurity when we are trying to control other people. Absolutely. And so. Right. If we relate to our children like they're exposures of us, we'll have a hard time loving them mm -hmm. and celebrating them. Mm -hmm. Or when they succeed, we'll use that to inflate ourselves. Yes. So yes. our insecurity will infect our relationship with them in ways that are not helpful, either positive or negative. So just being able to like really see and and celebrating that they are who they are, that their their weaknesses or inadequacies are okay. That there's nothing Right. You know, like I was socially awkward as an adolescent and I have a child who struggles similarly mm -hmm. and maybe even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, more introverted. So if I'm not paying attention, that can get that old insecurity can get triggered in me. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I'm trying to get her to address it mm -hmm. more because mm -hmm. my anxiety is right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Rather than, well, this is her path to walk. Yeah, this is hers to sort out. Right. I can settle down and talk about my experience if it's helpful to her. I can talk about what I believe would help her, but it's her process and don't try and make it mine or infect it 
with mm-hmm. my insecurity, love right. her enough to trust her in that process of sorting mm-hmm. it out. Right. Like, and right to get to that point instead of uh, to manage our anxiousness over that and to project confidence in her that like she can manage it in whatever the time frame it's going to really need to take her that's right so kind of going also more a little bit to your expertise a lot of parents really lack the tools and like confidence again to talk to their children about sexuality so many are just gonna then avoid it because and not everybody and i know you have a great course on how parents can talk to their kids about that if you Mm -hmm. could tell us a little bit about that but how Mm -hmm. would you suggest parents start the conversations and how does us being confident and secure in our sexual feelings and our sexuality really play into these conversations with our kids yeah well right so so much about your relationship to yourself just outside of the realm of sexuality even is getting telegraphed to your kids so the amount of Mm -hmm. compassion you have for yourself the amount of self-acceptance you have Mm -hmm. is being mapped by your child and it's teaching them something about how to relate to you and how to relate to themselves so I know for some of you that probably sounds like bad news because you're like, oh, great, you know, <laughs> I've got all my insecurities. Oh, no, but, right. Know, we don't really have another possibility. We have to kind of tolerate that. But I think that it's similar to sexuality, which is, you know, where we have to tolerate that we inherited what we inherited, either in our mm-hmm. relationship to ourselves or in a relationship to sex. But we can improve that with mm-hmm. deliberateness. And so that any growth we do within ourselves, first of all, makes a difference for our kids. So the more at peace we are in our own skin, the more at peace we are with the fact of being sexual beings, just that alone Mm -hmm. is very valuable. Mm -hmm. Because this is happening often at a nonverbal level for kids is like, Mm -hmm. does mom like it when dad touches her? Mm -hmm. You know, does mom pull away? Does Mm -hmm. mom seem comfortable with the fact that she's attractive? Mm -hmm. You know? Does she, mm-hmm. Or does she feel like, is she always hiding her body? Mm-hmm. She's super critical of herself. You know, those kinds of things our kids mm-hmm. are tracking about us. So the more work you just do on your relationship to your sexuality, mm-hmm. the better for your kids. And I have, you know, courses on that that are just mm-hmm. about like women and men, you know, each looking at their, with the messages they've learned about sexuality and embodiment and sensuality mm-hmm. and how one can rearrange that inside of themselves that that sexuality and goodness are connected to each other and in yeah. fact an inherent part of a joyful life but then when it comes specifically to our kids and being good mentors to them you need a, just a good roadmap of where your kids are developmentally and where you can be influential in that process So the course Mm -hmm. you're referencing, how to talk to your kids about sex, Mm -hmm. is just a course that gives you like what kids at age two benefit from, age Mm -hmm. four, age six, eight, you know, and through, and then what adolescents need from you. Mm -hmm. And so I think just having a sense of what the goal is, which I think of as sexual integration, you want to integrate your sexuality as a part of your sense of self. You want to integrate the fact of your embodiment as just a normal part of being a human being, Mm -hmm. but also link it to your values, have a Mm -hmm. moral anchor in that. That's very important because sexuality isn't just good or bad. It's, it is what you do with it and what Mm -hmm. you create with it. And you can either be destructive with your sexuality or create the capacity to really love and be loved through your sexuality. So if as a parent, you have a clear sense of what the aim is, because Mm -hmm. a lot of us as parents are just like, just, just stay away from it. Okay. Trust me. Right, 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 right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's more where we're operating from. And when our kids read us as being unable to give them something more than that, they will tend to go to peers and the internet, which can be disastrous. Right. They're going to go somewhere else and that's going to anchor them in they're going right. to take in all kinds of messaging and not have another view. Mm-hmm. So as hard as it may be, we live in a time where parents really need to to get educated enough about the process of emerging sexuality and what mm-hmm. the larger goal is and then what your role is in that process. 
so that mm -hmm. you're not just afraid of it and trying to get away from it and you're giving them at least a meaningful frame in which mm -hmm. to reference when they're going to hear a lot of other ideas and i see this with my kids they hear things from friends they hear things on the you know they read things mm -hmm. on the internet whatever but they also have another framing that was offered to them consistently mm -hmm. that i think then they are sorting out who they are in that Mm -hmm. which is a process that belongs to them, but they have the ability to reference parents who have, who are at peace with their sexuality, who love each other. And who and love each other, love yes. them, like have That's some right. structure. And if there's that sense of trust. They're much more likely to trust your messaging because they trust you. They trust what you've created in your life. And even if you're talking to your kids about what you haven't gotten right, but you mm -hmm. understand that even that gives them deeper freedom to step towards something stronger and better for their lives. Oh, I love that. I love that. So a lot of my listeners are mothers in the middle of life who have mm -hmm. also kind of quote, I'm going to say lost our sense because that's how it's talked about a lot, lost our sense of like who we are. And, and that shows up then in like just confidence in life and sexual relationships mm -hmm. and yes. just our identity. Definitely kind of it can be professionally but just in all of these senses where would you suggest that someone starts in this season of life to really rediscover their self after they've yeah. given so many years to other people and sure. also have changed right in, in really good ways like this Absolutely. isn't a bad thing it's a good Abs thing yeah 100 percent. yeah i think i see a lot of women in this stage of adolescence into young adulthood their identities are also shifting they're not needed in the same way where they were all hands on deck at another point in their lives and so then this question of i mean if you mother well you mother yourself out of a job out of a job right? yes and that's yes. hard <laughs> yes i just dropped my son off he for college uh yes took him to the airport to, to mm. go to another continent and that's wow. as we cried just said this is what you want this is what you this, want it's and it's hard and it's, it's hard painful <laughs> <laughs> yes and i see a lot of good women who are in a kind of crisis of identity at that point and try and then often looking at their marriage and trying to figure out like who are we and you know sometimes the spouse is at the height of his career at that mm -hmm. point and so there can be a lot of turmoil mm -hmm. and it's meaningful so a lot of times people think this is a disaster but it's mm. really very fertile mm -hmm. or growing into a deeper relationship with your identity and your sense of self some people just cling on to parenting keep being in right. overly immersed in their children's lives but in a way that's not helpful to their kids and is a way of like not growing into the next phase mm -hmm. i mean i don't mean to be kind of overstating the art of desire course but this is the women's course i was referencing no please earlier. do yeah it's very much a self-development course so it's a self and sexual development course so i'm talking about our relationship to our sexuality and our embodiment mm -hmm. and pleasure but also very much our relationship to our identity, our desires, because it's very linked to sexual mm -hmm. sexuality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do we outside of a frame of caregiving, which is often the frame that we've been handed as this sort of default identity, mm -hmm. how do we have a relationship to our other capacities, our other ways of being in the world? And how do we because a lot of women learn like this sort of selfless identity like what yeah you, that's what i was yeah like we have to relearn that our needs and desires are valuable right. and are equal because we've that's spent right. sometimes a couple decades have putting someone else's needs above ours and that's right that's right and that's valuable and it's and it's meaningful work to do that when you know especially in the earliest stages mm -hmm. children survival depends upon that sacrifice and that mm -hmm. prioritization uh but a lot of us have learned that's the only way to be a woman or if you're mm -hmm. a good woman you will always you will always do that mm -hmm. and that becomes its own liability because the mother who doesn't grow into other aspects of herself never feels good she never mm -hmm. feels good about herself so her children as they get older will start to caretake her you know mm -hmm and caretake her sense of self and so on, often by needing her or reassuring her. And so it's a real gift to your children to grow into the other aspects of self that you put aside for a while, mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. more at peace with who you are 
Mm -hmm. not just in a self-sacrificing role. That is beautiful. That is wonderful. Okay. So I thought I would wrap up this discussion on confidence by you and I um, just doing something fun. Let's share with our listeners something we're insecure about since that of course is a great way to relate to other people because I do talk so much about confidence and I I, you know, I still see so many insecurities in my own. Like, I think that's actually the beautiful work or that's a beautiful product of this work is, mm -hmm. is to realize, to see those things in ourselves and to still go on to realize they're okay and to kind of love them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you what's something you think you're insecure about. It can be anything. When I came up with this question, I realized, you know, I am still... I still have those feelings of insecurity when I post anything on Facebook or mm -hmm. Instagram, or we're doing this interview mm -hmm. on a Wednesday, my podcast release on Wednesday, anytime I put something out, mm -hmm. um, like I yes. still, I still have that. I think that's valuable just to tell people to like share even like with youth or other women that like those things are still there. And I just work to put them in the back seat and to have right. something else. I also am pretty insecure about some things I have to cook. I will say that <laughs> if someone asks me to do certain things in the kitchen, I'll be like, I don't, I don't know. So what about you? What are some, uh, okay. Well, I share both of those insecurities. I have more, I mean, yeah, oh, I, I have a lot I mean, more too, but <laughs> I mean, I, the, yeah, I, I mean, putting things out there is, is just always to kind of show a part of yourself Yeah, and to take the risk of invalidation and, you know, I still often get that invalidation. It, I never like it, but it, so that, that's kind of just, yeah, of, yeah. Of it's doing the work we it's do. It's part I think, of doing it. You know? Yeah. You just yep. kind of have to handle if you're going to be out there outward facing, you're going to get other people's things, comments, but also not as fun things coming towards you. And I think it, for me, it's about just normalizing that for myself, but that doesn't mean I like it and it doesn't mean I'm not insecure right. about it on some level. Let me see. I mean, I'm in, I'm very insecure in my capacity to with sports because oh. I'm very bad at them. I mean, I like did things like long distance running and I mm -hmm. exercise, but any kind of team sport, I think I wasn't especially coordinated, but also I didn't have binocular vision, so I don't <laughs> have good depth perception. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it's just miserable, like some party where people are like, hey, let's just play volleyball. I'm like, you know, I think I'm just gonna- You know what, I'll be the scorekeeper, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, I mean- I, I share that too. I could not, I always tell my daughter when, when she was in softball, I could not hit a, a ball with a bat to save my life, so. Yeah. Yeah, but that's good. Well, this has been so great. I appreciate your time so much on these conversations and I will link up in the, in the show notes and other places how people can learn about your work, your podcasts, your courses. Um, it really is fantastic. Thank so I appreciate so much, this, Heidi. Jennifer. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and interview that I had with Dr. Finlayson Fife. As much as I enjoyed doing it with her, you can find links to her courses, to her website, to her podcast um, in the show notes and also on the podcast page on HeidiBenjaminson.com. If you would like personalized weekly private one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you stay calm and anchored while your teen is on their emotional roller coaster, you sign up for a consult call at HeidiBenjaminson.com. A confident mother is the greatest gift to her family, not a perfect mother. Our families want us to feel confident, anchored, and calm. I can help you uncover this version of yourself. Have a great week. <music>